Well, uh, to quote my daughter at the end of that song, I love Lifeway. What an incredible service this has been. Uh, listening to Lucy talk about her father and talk about Mike, um, it made me, uh, I want to be like Mike. I want to be uh, the kind of father that he is. And uh, seeing those graduates, wow. I mean, just watching um, kids who I remember seeing small children grow up, graduating from high school and then graduating from college. Uh, such a moving thing. And that song, that last song, I feel like I've had to speak a couple of times after that group sings. And it's so hard to speak because they do such an amazing job. And uh, as I come to you today, I do want to wish everybody happy Father's Day. As Raphael said, my name is Mike Stephan. And along with my wife, Christy, we help lead a small group here in the church. And we get to serve on the uh, ministry team. And I'm one of the, um, the elder here. And uh, we have three daughters, uh, Jessica, Naomi, and Sophia. Um, and I want to tell you that uh, the most important role in my life is being a Christian. The second is being a husband. And the third is being a father. And I love being a father. And I was thinking about the message we're going to hear uh, right now. I'm going to give to you. Uh, please turn to Philippians 2, uh, which is we're going to start reading in a minute. And um, as I was watching the graduates and I'm thinking about my daughters, I was just thinking about how important the church is and how important the family of believers are. And, um, and I was thinking about this message and and I, and I, the more I thought about it, the more I think this message is needed for us today. What we're going to talk about today is unity. What we're going to talk about is what it means to be unified as a church and how do we get there. Um, it's hard to ignore all that's been going on in the world, um, and even though we're celebrating Father's Day. And uh, hopefully uh, I can uh, do a good mix of uh, speaking to what's happening outside as well as speaking to Father's Day. I will say that some of the best um, times as a father is when our family is unified. We have the times when we're together. Uh, I know personally I like the beach, and so we may be all at the beach together and watching all the girls have fun together. It's an amazing time. It's a dad time. Uh, one thing that we've been doing as a family over the years is we help with a toy drive at the church. And I remember sometimes just watching as our kids were you know, in their preteen years and a little bit younger, just watching them all work together. And it was just, it was amazing to me. In fact, I would just stop and knowing me, I'd probably shed a small tear and, and just look at the girls and just feel so grateful. So I just want you to be thinking about that as from a father's perspective, the importance of unity. Now let's look at Philippians 2, verse 1. It starts off where, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then I'm going to stop there for a second, because if you're a Christian, what he's about to say applies to you, because it doesn't say total encouragement. It doesn't say always comforted. It doesn't say always sharing in the spirit. It doesn't say you're always having compassion. It says if you have any, if it's ever occurred in your life, then you should do what the next thing says. And as Christians, we know we've had that. We know we've had some of that. It says, if then. It says, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. I just shared with you earlier about the importance for unity, I know, for me as a father. And I think every father feels that. And it doesn't surprise me that Jesus wants us to be unified. You know, in John 17, verse, John 17, uh, right before Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, he prays that the believers who come after the original disciples would be brought to complete unity. So Jesus wants us to be unified as a church. In fact, it says we should be so unified that we have the same love. We should be one in spirit and of one mind. Now, now, let's think about that for a second. It says, have the same love. Does that mean that we always have to show love the same way all together? We have to give love the same way? Every Christian should look just like the other Christian and how they, how they have the same love? Well, I hope not, because I know that, like, even with Christy and I, we're, we're married. We've been married 27 years. 
she's a touch person. She, you know, her love language is touch. She grew up in a Latin family. She's Latina. So they're hugging, they're kissing each other's cheeks, they're holding hands. And they're, that's how she, one way she expresses love. And you know, I, I'm just not that way. I know that may surprise you, but I'm, I'm not. But what I am is I love quality time. Some of my favorite times as a kid was playing cards with my father. Yeah, sorry to say my dad taught us all how to play poker. And those were some of the best times that we had being together. Then it says, does then it says being one, one in spirit. Does that mean we all have to have the same spiritual walk? We all have to pray the same way. We all have to read our Bibles at the same times or in the same places. Or we all have to read the same things at the same times. We all have to worship the same way, sing the same way. Is that what it means? I hope it doesn't mean that. Because, you know, just thinking about worship, I love seeing uh, our band, Lifeway United. I love the, the modern Christian music. I love the guitar. I love the drums. I love the singing. I love seeing the teens jumping up and down. It's an amazing thing. But you know what else I love? I love it when Peter Markowski gets up there with his guitar or gets up there with his ukulele and sings a song from way back when. I love it. It's awesome. And so hopefully that means we don't have to all have the same spirit and worship. And then it says, of one mind. Does that mean we have to think and speak the same way? Is that what that means? Does that mean we all have to do that? Well, I hope it doesn't mean that way. Because, you know, honestly, I like a little diversity. I like some, I like some little contrarians in the group. I like people that question. I like seeing the way different people think. And, and I actually really enjoy that. In fact, you know, I was an ER doc for a number of years and I led medical groups and I was chief of staff and things like that. And what I found was when there was diversity and diverse opinion, the best conclusion came up. So what does it mean? It says having the same love, one in spirit, one of mind, if it doesn't mean all doing the same thing. What's the same love? The same love is the love of God. We all need to have God's love. We all need to be loving as God calls us to be loving. What does God say? You know, in 1 Corinthians 13, it says love is patient, love is kind. It says love always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. That's the sort of love that we should all have in common. You know, in John 15, it talks about, Jesus talks about how, make my love complete. That if you remain in my love, you will obey my commands. That's the kind of love we need. Jesus says, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. That's the kind of one love that we need. It says to have the same spirit. What is that spirit? That's the Holy Spirit that we get when we get baptized. We've all been given the gift of the Holy Spirit of baptism. It says that in Acts 2. It also says that the spirit will come in truth. In John 16, it talks about how he will speak and he will tell us what we need to know and what we're going to find out in the future. It's an amazing thing to think about God's spirit. And what we need to be is not all singing the same or anything like that, but we need to be attentive and obedient to God's spirit. It's been amazing the way to see the spirit's been moving uh, in Lifeway. But we need to be obedient to that same spirit. It also says, Jesus said... And on one of the first scriptures he ever quoted as a, when he started his ministry, this is what he said. He quoted Isaiah. He said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. To have the same spirit, we're going to share the good news. We're going to proclaim freedom. We're going to help people recover sight. We're going to help people materially and physically. And we're going to set the oppressed free. We've heard this scripture a lot recently, and I think we need to embrace it. We need to embrace the oppression, the injustices, the inequalities that exist in our society, because that's what Jesus would do. And we need to embrace them in a spiritual way. And then it says being of one mind. What does that mean, being of one mind? Does it mean we think the same way? No, but it means we have the same standard. It means that we know God's word and that we allow God's word to be the guide for our life. I know with Christy and I, there is no way that we would be married without God's word. It has provided us a standard. It's provided our kids a standard. 
It's an amazing thing. And that's the way we need to be of one mind. And then, you know, think about it. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, those who hear my words and puts them into practice is like a man who, or woman who built his house on a rock. That is the one mind that we need to have. Unity begins when we understand God's love. Unity begins when we understand God's spirit and when we, when we, we set our minds on God. Let's go back to Philippians 2, verse 3. I'm going to try to get through this because I know we're running short on time. It says in verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Unity begins with humility. I first saw this scripture about 24 years ago. I was sitting in a small group and um, I was sharing about something happening with Christy and I. Because, you know, when you're a young married couple, you don't quite get it as, as well as you could and you, you struggle and whatnot. So I was sharing about some struggle. And uh, a brother there who I actually haven't seen since that moment, his name was Mike Brown. I think I met him twice in my life. And this was the last time I've ever saw him. He shared Philippians 2. He didn't know me. He just said, hey, let me help you out. And he shared Philippians 2. And I'll be honest with you, it changed my marriage. Without humility, you cannot have a great marriage. Without humility, it, it just doesn't work. And uh, when I was uh, about 22 years ago, I was walking up our street. My wife was pregnant with our first daughter, Jessica. And uh, you know, you know, first time father, you're kind of freaking out. You're not really sure how it's going to go. And, and I was thinking about what do I want my kids to learn? What what is what is the thing I want my kids to learn in this life? Having been through, at that point, I don't know, thirty some odd years of life. And I remember praying. I distinctly remember praying. God, teach them to be humble. If my kids could be humble, they're going to be okay. They're going to be okay because God gives grace to the humble. So about three weeks ago, there's a lot of stuff happening in LA throughout the United States, rallies, protests. And I was, I got off a 12 hour shift and I was upstairs and I was maybe eating something and watching the TV news. And I'm watching these protests in Los Angeles and I'm watching, you know, the guys running in and out of, you know, the looting and, and whatnot. And, uh, and I was just sitting there remembering that back to 1992 and, and what that was like during the riots when I was a, you know, a young physician working in the emergency department in, in Carson. And, uh, and I just was thinking, I was just a little bit confused. I was trying to figure it out. And, and I asked my daughter, Naomi, to come upstairs and she came upstairs and, and I started asking her about, you know, what do you think of all this? And, and I was trying to get the perspective of so, someone from a younger generation. Uh, you know, my daughters have been blessed. Uh, Christy's mom has been speaking about social justice her entire life, practically. They're blessed because they have a, a, a nana who uh, understands um, uh, the plight of uh, people of color. Uh, she's Puerto Rican, and uh, she grew up in a really uh, uh, difficult place. And, um, and she speaks all over the world about social justice. So my daughters have been influenced by that. So Naomi, Jessica, they're talking about social justice all the time and it's pretty awesome. So I was asking her, Naomi, what do you think? And we were going back and forth. She would get a little frustrated with me. I'd get a little frustrated with her. I'm thinking, man, if we can't figure this out, how's everyone gonna figure it out? We, we really like each other. And so we were going back and forth. And then finally, at one point, my daughter says, you know what, dad? You know what I think we all need? I go, no, Naomi, what do we all need? She goes, we all need a lot more humility, myself included. And I thought, wow, answered prayer 22 years ago. And then probably the most significant thing that happened was I received an email on June 1st. And the subject of the email was, is church a safe place to process? And it was written by a sister in our church, a black sister, Jillian Samuel. And um, just so you know, as a father, we love people who love our kids. I think Reese has talked about that. We do. So we love Jillian. 
Our youngest daughter, Sophia, if you were to ask her who's responsible for helping her become a Christian, I kind of thought she'd say me. And then I kind of thought she might say Christy, but she said Jillian. Because when she was at a time of studying the Bible, Jillian walked with her. Jillian listened to her. Jillian helped to understand her. It's pretty amazing. So we love Jillian. So when I get an email from Jillian, I'm, I'm reading that thing. I've got to see what she wants to say. And, and it was pretty amazing. And now I'll be honest with you. This email uh, changed my, the way I thought. This is, I'm going to read a portion of it. I asked Jillian by text today if she wouldn't mind if I read it. She said it's fine. So apparently she had a, a meeting at work, and this is in relation to that meeting she was going to have. She said that um, as the meeting was beginning, she says, one compassionate question changed the entire direction of this meeting. Said, how is everyone feeling with everything going on in our country? Again, this is Jillian writing. I feared it was going to be discouraging and unproductive, but it wasn't. People got raw and real. People listened to one another as, it sh as, it sh as I shared my hurts, my pains and experiences, people sought to learn and understand. Ultimately, I left the conversation feeling hopeful and very grateful. We began to process. And this is a space that I feel we've been lacking at, our, at this time in our church, a safe place for all our members, but especially our black brothers and sisters to process in a healthy and godly way, to be raw and real, with how we are feeling in productive ways that ultimately point us back to Christ. Because if we don't shape the conversation first, unfortunately, the world will. We need to talk about this as a church if we really want to be agents of truth and change. I know personally, and along with my household, we just want to have real talks and would love to learn from you and other leaders in our church how to process our pain and speak up for justice and still be Christ-like so that we are all more equipped to have these conversations. And so that our community group leaders will be more equipped to have these conversations as we strive to be an outpost to share the love of Christ in our communities. I'll be honest with you. That is the only time I got through this letter this morning without shedding a tear. This email is written in humility with the mindset of Christ. Humility seeks understanding and is willing to listen. Humility seeks truth. Humility takes strength. Humility is risky. It's risky because, as it says in Philippians 2, we are making a decision to value others above ourselves. We are making the decision to look to their interest and not just our interest. We are making the decision to strive to feel and understand the pain and the joys that other people feel. Humility takes faith. Humility in James 4 draws us closer to God. Humility allows us to be like Jesus, who in the very nature took on the form of a servant who didn't count equality with God as something to be uh, attained. As you think about this, I know it's Father's Day, but this message is because it's Father's Day. We just say, they just, we just heard a song and I wrote down these, the lines. I never heard that song before that I was just saying. And uh, it says, what they were singing was, may his favor be open and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children if we don't find this unity, if we don't act, find what, what Jillian was asking for, that will not continue for our children and their children. It is really up to us. So I'll just finish by saying this, that uniform is formed by humility, through humility, by drawing us closer to God's love, by allowing us to be led by his Holy Spirit and allowing us to be obedient to his word. Unity of God's children, if you look back in Philippians 2, makes God's joy complete. As we go out today and we celebrate Father's Day, I would just uh, ask you to remember, I pray that as you spend time with your family and your kids and your friends, that uh, you do find the unity that uh, God desires. And I pray, God, that as a church, we can find it more and more. <laughs>